know that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Praise God. Lord, we thank you tonight for the privilege we have to serve you. We ask, Lord, that you minister to your church tonight through the spirit and power of God. Hallelujah. Jesus' name, we give glory and honor to you now. Through the divine anointing, speak now to the church in Jesus' name. Praise God. God, looking tonight, seeing who was going to be here, knew you were going to be here tonight and wants to minister to you. It came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the Philistines. The reason why God did not do this is for many, many, many various reasons. Praise God. Many, many various reasons. Whether you know it or not, by the right of traitors in that day, the journey from where they were going to the land of promise was only six days. It only took the traders that traveled from one place to the other to trade their goods in that day, six days to go what took the children of Israel 40 years. Praise God. And when you read this, it's said here, but God led the people about through the way of the wilderness. And I want to tell you tonight that your way, uh, if I minister to you on a thought tonight, it's going to be the way God chooses. The way God chooses. Hallelujah. God has chose for each and every one of us a wilderness journey. Somebody says, how's come some of these people backslid the last few years? Because they have lost their way in the wilderness. I said they have lost their way in the wilderness. There were many of them that lost their way in the wilderness and were left out there to die and left to the buzzards. I'm telling you, you say, well, they're not dead tonight. They're dead. They're spiritually dead, and they're left to the demonic spirits, the buzzards of this world. My wife told me tonight that that little girl was not run or was not in the back of her room praying, but she was running for her life when they shot her and killed her. She splashed all over the papers again today. You'd think she was the only one who got shot and killed. But there's 13 other kids. Amen. Praise God. I'm here to tell you tonight, the buzzards are out to get your flesh. Spiritual demons. My wife and I were traveling down the road the other day, coming in from uh, Iola where we had preached last Saturday. And huge black buzzards were about three, four hundred feet off the ground going around in circle. I said, something's died out there. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, there is demonic buzzards circling over your head waiting for you to die. Waiting for you to get away from the church. Waiting for you to get out by yourself so you get singled out and killed and ate by the dem demons of this world. It's a danger to get away from the church and the house of God. It's a danger to miss God's church. I'm here to tell you, you need to pay attention to something. That when you miss a church service, it's lots easier to mix the next one. And it gets easier and easier to miss the next one. Until finally you don't want to go no more. Why? Because you're under condemnation. You've sit there and listen to the devil tell you you're too sick to go to church. You're too tired to go to church. Nobody down there loves you. 
I said the buzzards are circling over your head. You better not entertain those demonic spirits. You better come to church sick and say, I'll get prayed for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The only time we don't want you around here in a church service is when you're running a high fever, infectious, and going to infect everybody else. Outside of that, don't let a toothache stop you from coming to church. I'm going to tell you people something. My wife is a witness that I had toothaches to glory, man. I mean, a few weeks ago. My whole mouth was swell up. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how you folks was understanding me while I was preaching to you. I mean, my mouth was a mess, and I was right here in this pulpit preaching. Hurt! Hurt so bad, tears run down my cheeks, and I wasn't even crying. Praise God. But I was here in this pulpit preaching to you. Hallelujah. We got a God. We got an obligation. I'm not staying out of the house of God. I've made up my mind. This is where God dwells at. And I'm going to be with Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I want you to know something. God's got a wilderness journey. Yes, we could maybe take a shortcut. There's a lot of folks trying it today. I don't need, my wife stood in the line today, she said, look at all these old women. Man, I got to looking at them, their hair was shorter than their husbands. I bet it took their husband longer to comb his hair than it did her. Amen. I'm here to tell you something tonight. God hates that mess whether you know it or not. If that's the only way to fill up your church, I'll never make it. I don't believe it's the only way though. I believe there's a lot of folks out there that want holiness. They're looking for a holiness preacher. They're looking for a holiness people. They're looking for somebody. I'm telling you what, sister, first time I seen Sister Dills, I thought, my goodness, I don't know if that poor woman will make it in here or not. Praise God. You know, she's got this and she's got that. and she's... But there was something she did have that I didn't know about, and that was a hungry soul. And, and God used a kook to bring her into the truth. And you can laugh about that all you want to. God used, God used an old prostitute to bring Brother Doug in here. It's an amazing thing how God brought some of you here because he, he knew you had a hungry soul inside of you. And I'm going to tell you something. They're still in this city. And they're still all over the place. And God's got a way of bringing them. Bless God, all we got to do is have faith and work the work of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. My God, my mom brought Sister Patricia years ago. Here she comes back with a different hairdo, different color, and I don't even know who she is. Praise God. Hallelujah. But God knows, and He knows how to get you. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. He knows a hungry heart, and He knows how to woo it, and He knows how to draw it. Praise God. And it's time we get some faith in us and get on fire for Jesus Christ. Get us some Bible studies. I went over there yesterday, you know, this poor little old Indian, he thinks he's got a problem because he's born and raised an Indian. Now it is a problem when you can believe all kind of goofy things are God's. And he looked at me and he said, just how do I throw this Indian religion away? I said, I don't know. Let me ask you a question. I said, how does a guy raised out in the jungle in Africa with a bone in his nose eating people dancing around bonfires and everything, and a missionary comes over there, and they hear the glorious gospel preach, and he turns away from that kind of life, and he turns to this kind of life. I'm going to tell you something. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to bring the truth to you, and if you want truth, then you're going to have a chance to receive it, and if you don't, you'll reject it and walk on by. And God is after every hungry soul. I'm telling you something. I don't care how you was raised. God knows if you're hungry for truth. And so he's going to bring the truth. And the church does not need to worry about how to reach a heathen. The church needs to know how to present the gospel and preach the gospel. We're not going to reach heathens with heathenly stuff. We're going to reach heathens, bless God, by preaching the truth. Telling how the Lord set you free. How the Lord set me free. 
But in the way and on the way, there's a walk between here and the new Jerusalem. And that's what I want to minister to you about tonight. God could baptize us with the Holy Ghost and the next day put us in New Jerusalem. But he didn't choose to do that. He said, I've got to teach these slaves, first of all, to get away from Egypt. Did you hear what he said? Did you read your Bible? Did you see what he said? He said, and God led them through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was not near. He didn't take them the shortcut because he said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they go back to Egypt. Let me tell you something. When you get in this, I have, I don't know how many people say to me, well, that's the funniest thing that before I ever got in church, I didn't have no troubles till I got in church. And then after I got in church, I started having trouble. Well, first of all, it's a big lie. Because almost every one of us would come to church because we was having troubles. I mean, you know, after your third man, you need somebody to help you out. So, said, well, what about the man with the third woman? Well, he's, he needs God pretty bad because we had one sitting here and listening to me preach last year that had ten women. I said, mercy sakes a lot. How could any one woman make him happy after ten of them? You know, some of you women think men are so expendable. Let me tell you something. There are a whole lot more women than there is men. I never will forget I blowed old gal's hairdo loose one day. She walked in. She said, you're against women in combat, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not. She said, you're not. I was. I decided I'm just going to blow you loose. She said, you're not against women in combat? I said, no. She said, why aren't you? I said, because by the time we kill a few million of you off like you have us, we'll have a vote left. <laughs> Praise God. You don't understand that? Well, then it's too bad. I don't know how to explain it to you. Praise God, since there's only about 12 women to a man in this country. Hallelujah. Well, we only killed millions of men off in World War II. Now we kill them off with abortion. Most folks don't know it. I didn't either until I studied one night, and it like to blow me right out of the chair. That abortion kills more males than it does females, which only makes sense because God knows that men are for war. And so he causes more males to be born than he does females. And so most of the abortions are males. Praise God. The only one I know of that don't abort their males is China. And they got the biggest marching army in the world. Amen. I didn't intend to get in all that, but I did. Praise God. What are we? It's still part of our wilderness journey. We're in it. We're in it. I don't even want to preach about Kosovo and all that stuff. I don't want to. I want to get this church into something spiritual. Praise God. Amen. But we're in it. We're living in it. Praise God. It's infecting and affecting us. Amen. It's part of the wilderness journey. I am concerned about it because it could get Brother Joe and Brother Brent and Brother Daniel. Amen. I don't believe they belong in that mess. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Woo. You see, God says, I'm going to put you on a wilderness journey. And he looks at some of you mamas, and you mamas have got trouble with your kids, and your kids has made a wreck out of your life spiritually. I mean, you get down to pray, you don't even know what to pray. Didn't even get one amen, but it's a truth. And I'm sitting in here looking at four or five moms that knows what I'm talking about. Maybe six or seven. Hello. Man, as I look around, maybe nine or ten. Hello. Why is it like that, Brother Elder? Because you're on your wilderness journey and God's going to find out if you're going to make it to the promised land. You can get destroyed in the wilderness. You don't keep your eyes on the pillar of fire. And you don't keep your eyes on the cloud. And you get your eyes on Moses. And you get your eyes on Aaron. And you get your eyes on those families over there. That bunch over there don't clean up the church on Saturday night like this bunch over here does. I'm telling you, it's a, it'll affect you. You don't come in here and clean up the church because that bunch. You come up here and clean up the church because this is a house of God and you love God's house and you got a burden for the house of God. Hallelujah. That's why you're in here cleaning this place up. You don't do it because of Joneses and the Smiths and the, Hello. Praise God, you do it because this is God's house. I love to be around God's house. I love to be around His Spirit. It's wonderful working around the house of God, working in the house of God. It's a pleasure to clean the floor. Hey, I'm telling you something. I've cleaned these floors this year myself, and I'm the pastor. 
And I didn't walk around saying these bunch of dumb people are pastors. They had any that. No, I ain't what I said at all. Praise God. Let's get this place cleaned up. There's people kneels down here and prays and gets saved. None of one of them has to hear notes and that stuff. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. How many of you think we need the right attitude? We just need to get under the glory cloud with the spouts coming out. Well, so-and-so don't do this and so-and-so. Well, how come you're worried about so-and-so? I thought you was in here living for Jesus. Hmm? Hmm? How come so-and-so's got you this and got you that? You know something? If you're worried about what so-and-so's doing around here, you ain't living for God. You're trying to protect yourself. You're trying to get so-and-so to do more than you have to do. Hello! Where are we at on the wilderness journey? Why get confused, Brother Eller? You won't if you got your eyes on the cloud. If you got your eyes on the pillar of fire, you won't get confused. You can't get confused looking at Jesus. I'm telling you, somebody was trying to make me feel bad about what happened to me and some things lately. And I said, I'm going to tell you something. Still yet, they've never jerked my beard out. Still yet, they've never spit in my face and cussed me. Still yet, they haven't done a whole lot of these things. And I said, they did it to the one I love. Hallelujah. I ain't gone as far as he's gone. I'm telling you, I still, hallelujah, got some things uh, to praise God for that I ain't had to go as far as he went for me. God help us tonight. Where are you at? You're on your wilderness journey. Where are you going to make it through the jungle? You're going to make it through the wilderness? God said, oh, I could take them the shortcut, but they need to learn how to fight and be warriors. He said, no. He said he wasn't going to take them through the land of the Philistines. You know why? They were warriors. The Philistines were fantastic warriors, and they were slaves. They'd just come out of Egypt. And God said, they don't know how to fight. i got to take them. And if I got in the 33rd chapter of the book of Numbers... My God, it seems like every six miles they stopped and camped out. I said, boy, they didn't go very far and they didn't get much done. Bad shape as I'm in, I'd go that far. You know, you say, well, I don't see how it's come. Uh, let me tell you something. Grandma was probably excited when they left Egypt. She was so excited when they left Egypt. But you know what? Grandma one day said, you know, I was so excited when we left Egypt. I wanted to see the promised land. But you know, I'm not going to live long enough. I'm not going to make it. Because people begin to grumble about the bread from heaven. Huh? I don't know. Let me ask you something. Where this is in Pentecost a day, and it never was in the Pentecost that I grew up in because we were terrified of it. But people today judge a preacher by the way he's preaching, whether it was good or bad. They're so sick of manna from heaven. They think they have. They think that they're an official judge of the judging the bread from heaven. And they begin to grumble about what God was sending them. Where did you ever think that you sitting in the pew have the right to judge one thing the preacher says? You never have been given that authority. What makes you think you can do it? That authority has never been invested in you. I'm telling you, it's dangerous for you to sit there and judge the man of God while he's preaching. Why? You going, your bones are going to bleach out in the wilderness. You're going to die spiritually. God get mad at you. The buzzards are circling over you. You ain't got one little bit. Oh, Brother Elder was on fire tonight. What makes you think because he's going slow he's not on fire? He ain't on fire just because he's spitting all over the place. He's on fire because God has spoke to him to speak to the people. I always was, you know, I don't know nothing about raising horses. Anybody in here know anything about raising horses today? Uh, Sister Dill, I know you did a lot of horse racing. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. And I, they told me, I was listening to a program coming to church tonight and said said that horses are like humans. They don't like change water. And so these folks have learned to put Coca-Cola in their water. And that way they won't know they're changing water. Praise God. I don't know nothing about it. I don't know nothing about raising cows either. Hallelujah. Praise God. I don't know much about raising mules either, but my dad said there's only one way to raise a mule. He said when you get out of bed of the morning, you hit that mule right between the eyes with a tube before, and the rest of the day you got his attention. So, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't want to be like that. I want you. I want the Lord to lead me. Huh? I don't want to be like that. Praise God. Hallelujah. How many of you want the Lord to... How many of you want to be able to drink the water the Lord gave you? Praise God. You don't have to put Coca-Cola in it. 
Just give me that water out of the rock, Lord. Just give me that water out of the rock. Hallelujah. Praise God. Anybody want to be able to drink out of the, out of the bowels of heaven? We're on the wilderness journey. Oh, water. Well, I'll tell you one thing. You ain't thirsty. I'll tell you one thing. Oh, God, I'll never forget one time I was in the army. It was hot. And the chiggers was tearing us up. And I went back there, and I pumped some gas. We had electric fuel pumps on those tanks. And, and I pumped some gas in a number 10 can, and I got some oil. And I, and I uh, went and mixed that oil and gasoline up and rubbed it all over me. Just rough. What you, I was going after them chiggers. Ooh, those chiggers was getting the best of me. And, and I said, oh yeah, that gas and oil will get the best of them, but you want to be careful because cause if, if you're real sensitive skin, you'll have something besides chiggers. Have beautiful blisters. Praise God. And it worked for me. Man, I went after those chiggers. And, and it's dinner time, you know, and they give us some little round cans. That was dinner. And it was hot. And I opened it up and I ate it. It tasted horrible, man. Oh, the only thing you could get out of those cans that was good was peaches and pears. Praise God. I never will forget. I thought, what is in this can? I picked it up and I started reading it. And it said, horse meat packed in 1944. And I was so thirsty when I got through with that that I ran down to the creek and laid down on my belly and I looked and some tanks had just went through it and it was muddy. And I said, who cares? <laughs> oh, God, it was even worse. I'll tell you something. Some of you just don't get thirsty. I know some folks that's proud. I don't drink water. What do you drink? Coca-Cola. Tea. I heard a doctor on the radio recently say they are prime candidates for cancer. People who do not drink water are prime candidate for cancer. I'll tell you, if you don't drink that water that's coming out of the rock, you're going to get so spiritually sick, something's going to kill you. You better get thirsty for that water that comes out of the rock. Hallelujah. Bless. Oh, God, it's got mud in it. You just ain't thirsty. Brother, when you really get thirsty, you'll suck that water out of the rock. I was thirsty when I was a kid one day. I was walking and walking and walking and walking and walking through the woods. And I got lost like the children of Israel in the wilderness. Going, You know, unless you're a woodsman, you, you got to pay attention because you'll start going in circles out there. Praise God. And, and I noticed that I had done passed this way before. And I finally straightened up my axe and I said, hey, the house is that way. And I took off and I come up over a hill and there was a spring bubbling up out of the ground. Beautiful, clear water. And I said, oh, man, I'm so thirsty. And I fell down and I sucked on that stream and I said, yeah. I forgot to look around and see all the red around that spring. It was a sulfur spring. You talk about thirsty, I was double timing to the house then. Praise God. Praise God. How many of you like that water that's out of the rock? Huh? That's what we was up here drinking well ago, is that water out of the rock. What are you talking about? We're on our wilderness journey. I just plain don't like it. Quail. Can you believe that? The best meat there is on earth. I'll trade you a pheasant for six quail any day of the week. Praise God. I'll trade you a chicken for six quail any day of the week. I'll trade you a T-bone steak for six quail any day of the week. Why? Because how many years ago, honey, Jeffrey was still alive. And we was going to New Mexico. And we pulled in there and they had quail sandwiches. And I said, wow, babe, look at this. They got quail sandwiches. I'm going to get me one. And I looked over at that, that menu, $4.33. I said, no, I ain't. I'm going to get a hamburger. <laughs> Jeffrey was still alive. That had to be back in 1970. $4.33. I imagine a quail sandwich right now cost you right around $16. And here these people are living high on the land and just sick of it. We had to eat these birds every day. I'm just telling you, Brother Elder's got the same old stuff all the time. Just seems like I wish he'd get something different. I wish he'd get something that tastes good. You know what I was looking at tonight? We was doing the most simplest thing we ever could tonight. We was loving each other, praying one for another. And did you know what I noticed tonight out of the church? We got more results out of that spiritually than we did with the choir singing. Because God loves the simple things of life.
We're in a wilderness journey. And you know what's more important than anything? Is that your soul is affected and your soul is touched than anything else. It's not important that you can, you know, oh, I get inspired by singing too, yeah. It's, you know, Sister Patty, your daddy was one guy that I like to listen to sing. Why? Because that guy could go way down low and way up high. What was that song he used to sing? Uh, something about, I can't remember. I want to walk just as close as I possibly can. Boy, he could sing this. Man, I was impressed listening to her daddy sing this. Oh, well, this has been 25 years ago, you know. He may not can sing that low and that high now. You just, you just wait till you're 65. We'll see how good you can sing. Huh? 78? He really is? I never would have dreamed he's that old. Praise God. Praise God. Well, if he can carry a tune at all, it's wonderful. <clears throat> Praise God. At 78. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. I want to tell you something. I like to hear people that can really throw their voice around and sing. Boy, you go sit down at general conference anymore instead of getting up and shouting and dancing and the power of God falling down, you sit down and you look at them singing and you look at the other and say, boy, they got a voice, don't they? It ain't like it used to be when I was growing up. When I was growing up, it was Holy Ghost and fire. Now it's, wow, listen at them sing. Listen at that voice. Wow. I'm telling you what we need back in the church is the fire. We need the fire so bad back in the church that the, that the rheumatism's getting healed. And the sugar diabetes is getting healed. Brother, brother, can't think of his name down there south of us, honey. Was telling us in a fellowship meeting the other night how sugar diabetes made him go blind. A preacher. My God, don't you think it's time that we get back to eating that good old quail? Amen. That good old manna from heaven. That good old bread from heaven. That good old meat. Hallelujah. That'll make you a, a, a matured saint. What are you talking about? That'll make you a warrior. That'll make you able to fight. you got to go through hard times before you can be anything solid. You don't never see a man that's, that's got all kind of things on his chest that ain't been in combat. Somebody said, well, he's got 20 years in the military. I'm telling you something. If he's got 20 years in the military, it's a miracle he's alive. He's been through two or three wars. Amen. Somebody said, well, not all of them. Well, I don't think everybody goes in there and sits at a typewriter for 20 years. Fact is, I never met one that did. Hallelujah. But I'm going to tell you one thing. He's been in there for 20 years. He's been somewhere where it's bad news. Where he had to really strive to stay alive where he had to really strive to keep his mind strong mentally. Amen. I'm telling you what, Brother Kirker, when they start blowing buildings away in front of your very eyes, it'll make you strong mentally, or it'll make you crash. What are you saying, Brother Elder? I'm saying some of you seen families blowing away since you're in the church. It's either affected you and now you have become mentally, spiritually sick, or else it's made you strong to be a strong warrior and got your mind made up, uh, that your foot's on the rock and your mind's made up and you're going through. They may fall on the right hand side of me and on the left hand side of me, but I got my mind made up. I, I'm going to the wilderness. I'm headed to the New Jerusalem. I'm not stopping till I cross over Jordan. Hello, hello, hello. Where we at tonight? We're on a wilderness journey. I said, we're on a wilderness journey. We're on a wilderness journey. Hallelujah. I'm telling you something. We don't have to be afraid of nothing. These people are on foot. And God destroyed the horse and the rider. Man, the story of the Red Sea is awesome. My Bible said two times in the same chapter that on the right side of them was a wall and on the left side of them was a wall. Two times in the same chapter. And, and I don't know, but I'm going to look this over a little bit closer. But it seems to me like as I read the Bible tonight that right behind the last guy going through the children of Israel that the wall was coming together behind. You say, when I how could that do without catching up with them and washing them away? Let me tell you something. With God, there ain't nothing impossible. God just let them get far enough out there that they got out there and got to following after them people. And of course, 
Boy, they knew they was in trouble. When their wheels got stuck in the mud, they said the Lord's fighting for the Israelites. <laughs> but as I begin to read it, I'm going to have to check it some more before I just preach it. Hallelujah. It sounded like the water was coming together behind the last guy. I'm going to tell you something. It looks like sometimes we ain't going to make it. But I'm going to tell you something. We're going to make it because the rear side of us is the angel of the Lord. God said in the Bible that he moved the angel of the Lord from in front of them to the rear of them. Hallelujah. And the rear side was the angel of the Lord. Whew. Praise God Almighty. Hallelujah. I feel like running, shouting, and dancing tonight. Amen. I said I feel like running, shouting, and dancing right now. You say, well, Brother Elder, my God, how come you ain't never figured out? Yeah, I'm in the wilderness journey, but I'm going to tell you something. It's God that gives me water out of the rock. It's God that gives me bread from heaven. It's God that's sending down this meat. Hallelujah. It's God that provides for me daily. It's God that pays my bills. It's God that gives me health. It's God that puts a Holy Ghost in me. It's God that gives a desire to be in the house of God. It's God in my life every day, every hour, every minute. When you get to where it's God, it's God, it's God, it's God, it's God. You can't be nothing but happy, 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 happy. You can't be nothing but faith, faith, faith. You can't be nothing but joy, joy, joy. You can't be nothing but peace, peace, peace. Why? Because he is my forward and he is my rearward. He is on this side of me. He is on that side of me. I have nothing to fear. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, God, I'd tear Job up. But you got a fence built around him. I said, well, let God take that fence down. Well, let him take it down if that's what you want. I'd just soon he keep it up. Amen. I've had the fence down. I was glad he put it back up. Amen. It's all right with me, Lord. Build a fence around. Hello. Anybody like the angel of the Lord traveling with you? Amen. Being your rearward and your forward? Better know he knows the way. He knows the way that I take, hallelujah. You see what God was teaching these people is they had to maintain for themselves. Why? Because he was fixing to give them cities, houses they hadn't built, vineyards they had not planted. He was fixing to give them things beyond their ability to take care of them if he had not made them learn to be committed and responsible in the wilderness. I don't know if I'm going to church tonight or not. I'm tired. No, 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 no. See, you, you don't know whether you're going to the promised land either. God's going to give you time to opt out in the wilderness because you're not capable of taking care of the promised land. And ain't nothing entering in that city. Nothing that don't appreciate God. Don't appreciate those mansions. Don't appreciate those streets of gold. Don't appreciate those gates of pearl. My God, you listen every by day, everything's going to heaven. It wouldn't even be a good reason to go there. It'd be a good reason to stay away from there. But I'm here to tell you everything ain't going there. Not even everything in an apostolic church. Let me tell you, oh, I know you ain't going to like this. I know you're going to wish the pastor would have just shut up. But I'm going to tell you something. Jesus said there's two in the bed. One went and the other didn't. Jesus said there's two at the mill. One went and the other didn't. Jesus said there's ten virgins. Five went and five didn't. You know what he's telling me? Fifty percent of what we think in here is going to heaven is not. They don't like that bread from heaven no more. They don't like that water. Something else, some kind of juking and jive music out of the world gets them more excited than the music of God and the church. There ain't no juking and jive music in the world sets me up at all. I hate the trash. Period. I don't care whether it's country music. There ain't no such a thing as spiritual rock music. No such a thing. There ain't no such a thing as spiritual rap music. Somebody said, what about spiritual country music? There ain't no such a thing. Hello. There ain't no way you're going to love sister and, and miss the other sister. I'm sitting here in my skins, drooling over you. You got the right attitude about your wife or you ain't going to heaven. You got the right attitude about your husband or you're not going to heaven. 
I'm telling you, God knows what's inside of each and every one of our hearts, and he knows where our real love is. He knows if we'd rather listen to goofy old worldly music than we would the music that God gives us. You want to get yourself so spiritually flat? Just listen to that trash in the world. You're also teaching your children to do it. And if you teach your children to do it, don't get excited and upset when they do it even more than you do. Hello. I said, hello. Hello. What's wrong with that music, that good old Holy Ghost and Fire music? What's wrong with that music about how the Lord brought me out? What's wrong with that music about the streets of gold? Hallelujah. Amen. What's wrong with that music, how the Lord set me free from the world? That's the kind of music I want my kids to hear. I walked in and shut Sister Sarah's music off the other night, and she got upset at me. And I thought, well, that's probably good because she was listening to it. And I didn't think what she's listening to was bad at all. It was just, I came from the prison, and they just laughed, slap, slap, drained me. And I didn't want you to sing to me, and I didn't want you to talk to me, and I didn't want you to bother me. I didn't want you to do nothing. I just wanted to sit on the couch and be left alone. She wasn't doing a thing wrong. She was doing what her daddy trained her to do, listen to good music. Praise God. It's what want my children to listen to. You listen to that other junk, it'll get in your spirit. It'll get in your walk, in your daily life. I don't even care if it's got a good rhythm, you know. It's dancing music. Who you dancing with? Uh, who you dancing with? I quit dancing with strange women. I started dancing in the arms of Jesus. Boy, it's quiet in here now, huh? Why? Because we're on our wilderness journey, that's why. I don't believe in Christian rap music either. I don't care if, if it don't sound like rap music to you. Rap music is any time they're just talking. And I don't care, bless God, when they're talking even a little bit nicer than that. It's still rap music. They just try to break you in a little bit at a time. I'm not talking about whatever his name is. He's a tearjerker. Hallelujah. He talks you through when mama used to make us kids kneel down at her knees. And mama is up in heaven crying over me. It's just, you know, me and me and me and me and mama. What's wrong with that, Brother Eller? Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? I'm not talking about no tear-jerking thing to get into your emotions. I'm talking, you get Jesus in this thing. I'm telling you when those people moved is when that pillar of fire started moving, they started moving. When those people moved, when that cloud started moving, they started moving. I'm telling you what the church needs in its life again is the pillar of fire and the cloud. That's what ought to make us emotional. That's what ought to get us stirred up. That's what ought to get us excited. The fire and the pillar back in our lives again. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Well, I'd like to finish preaching this, but I can tell you're already wore out. You're used to my 30 minute sermons on Sunday night. Hallelujah. I want to tell you something. We're going home. We're almost there. We're just about ready to cross over Jordan. I want to tell you something. Before they crossed over Jordan, the biggest battle they ever had was there. Jericho sat right on the other side of Jordan. That was the biggest battle they had. I'm telling you, we're just about to cross Jordan, but Jericho's sitting right on the other side. And it's going to take a church that's got faith in God. So what are we going to do? You're going to follow the ministry. You're going to follow the priests because... Jordan never did stop swelling until the priest stepped into it and the people followed the priest on over. You're going to follow the ministry. I'm telling you right now, we got a sorry, no good for nothing leader in this nation. And we got a bunch of wimp dogs down there in the Republican houses and representatives and senators. And, and, they, and, and, and Mr. Clinton says, yuck! And they all say, oh! And the whole nation thinks we all got to be like that. We all got to follow yuck! I'm telling you, God gave you a preacher. God put a minister in your life. And I'm telling you, you better start following that man that God put in your life. We're fixing a cross over Jordan. You don't pay no attention to those far, far south there. 
Well, they're making life rough on us. Jesus said they would. And I was sitting here thinking the other day, well, we put them Republicans where they're at, and they are giving us conservative Christians more trouble than it's worth. But I said, what are we going to do? Go down and vote for a bunch of Democrats? Are you gonna? Well, you know what? If you're going to do that, you might as well pick up a 38 and say, Phew. That's right. I mean, their platform is sorry. They're, they're, they're for more queers, and we got more now, and we know what to do with it. They're trying to tell us not to pay attention to the Bible, that this is the time now to be politically correct. What is that? Somebody say, get out of politics, Brother Ella. I'm telling you, I ain't in politics. You better wake up. I'm telling you, it's time to follow the man of God and not the trash that's floating on top of the water. Hello, it's time to follow the priesthood. We're fixing to cross over Jordan. We're fixing to go into the hardest battle we ever had. But out of it comes the most mightiest revival we ever seen. I'm telling you, they had a revival. They captured that place. They took over that place. Hallelujah. It was a victorious thing. They went through a river that was impossible. You, you folks never studied that river. You need to study that river. I'm telling you one time when I got to study in that river, when those priests walked out in that water, that water backed up till it destroyed seven cities upstream. That's backing a river up now. I'm telling you what, we get to doing what God wants us doing and following the man of God. We don't have to worry about enemies around here. God will take over. All we got to do is have the revival God wants us to have. Follow the man of God. Get him behind the priest. Well, I just can't figure it out. You ain't never going to figure it out. Because he's never figured it out. I don't never figure out one. You know something? I'm going to tell this church something honestly before I close tonight. When God tells me to do something, I don't say why. When God tells me to do something, I don't say how it's come. When God tells me to do something, I don't say, will it work? It's impossible for you to, you to... When God says, go, I'm telling you, those Pharaoh's army was on those Israelis. They was fixing to take over and kill them. And they sitting there looking at Moses and said, we've been better off to die over there than we are out here. You know what God said? Hold that rod out and go forward. Praise God. Go forward. It's time, bless God, we go forward. It's time we quit looking at Egypt. It's time we quit looking at the world. It's time we quit looking at all that stuff. God is going to take you through. You don't know what's going to happen to your kid, but I promise you if you do right, God will save it. I wish to God I could get mothers to pay attention to me. If I could get mothers to pay attention to me, they'd be so happy. They'd see their children get saved, but they rush off with their heart and their emotions and destroy everything. Amen. You men, you need to follow the man of God. Sit around trying to figure out why and how's coming, how I'll never get you there. He don't even know the wise house coming wherefores. How you tell me to bless God, how you can hold a rod out over an ocean and divide it. Now, if you think you can out thank God, you explain that to me. Said so it ain't no ocean. You, you just go there. You can't see across it. The Great Lakes ain't no ocean either, but you think they are. I promise you one thing you can't see on the other side. Amen. Praise God. You think you're going across an ocean by the time you walk to the other side. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, you see all that stuff open up wide and you go, you, you tell me how you're going to hold a rod out there and divide that. There ain't nobody knows how you're going to do it. Only God said, hold the rod out. Then he looked at Moses and the people and said, go forward. Well, what about all them guys back there? Who cares? The angel of the Lord done move from up here back there. I belong to God. Anybody in here belong to the Lord? And bless God, let's quit trying to figure out everything and just get to church and worship Him with all of our heart. And when He gives us bread from heaven, let's love it. And when He gives us meat, let's eat it. Meat is, you know, quail meat's sometimes a little strong. It ain't near as strong as pheasant. It ain't near as strong as goose and duck. Goose and duck, you got to cook a lot of stuff with them to eat them. <laughs> Praise God. Quail, though, you just put a little pepper on there, boy. Just, ooh. Uh, 
I shut up. And uh, praise God. Mm, that stuff's good. Hallelujah. You know, we need to just eat it. Eat it. Don't you get tired of eating the same thing every day, Brother Elder? The whole truth of the matter, I'm not one of those kind of people. You can ask Sister Elder, you feed me fish for breakfast, dinner, and supper. Praise God. I mean it. I'm serious. I love fish. Oh, God, I love fish. Praise God. Just love it. Yeah, if I get burned out on meat, it's hamburger. I'm telling you the truth. I've, they do stuff with hamburger. My God, you can fix hamburger 4,000 ways. And when you get through with it, you still got hamburger. Praise God. Hallelujah. You can only stretch a cow so far. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, I wonder how many of you want some strong meat. Huh? Be careful now. 